Hey, we're on a break right now, and hopefully you are too, but um, for your edification during this period, we've been delving into the archives, finding a few episodes from ancient history that maybe you haven't heard, maybe you have, maybe you want to hear again, but might be something that you could enjoy right now. And for this one, well, we're used to the idea that uh, there are certain things that we shouldn't eat, certain things that maybe aren't good for your body. Toenails? Uh, that's one of them. That's one of them. <laughs> Definitely. No toenails. Don't need a scientific study to show <laughs> that. But we did need a scientific study back in the olden times to show us that maybe sugar wasn't great for us. And it's great that we know that, but the path that we got to know that fact was also not great. Enjoy. This is the sugar experiments of Vibe Home. God bless the Swedes. We'll be back with fresh episodes at the end of January. Enjoy. So uh, my Nordic cousins are nuts <laughs> about candy. Do you mean the people of the Nordic lands? Yes. Yes. Okay. Not, not my literal cousins. Cool. Because they're Latvian, <laughs> which isn't. It's close. It's close. Um, but the the most nuts about candy are the Swedes. Uh, the Swedes love the sweets. In the world. Mm. They're the, okay. De depending on the study. So there's a Swedish Board of Agriculture study that said they eat more per year, per capita, more candy than any other nation. And we're talking about 30 pounds per person per year each. So that's about, I don't know, eight and a half thousand kilos. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> and so that they're into it. They love it. But they've actually made it kind of a national pastime. So they have this thing called Lerds Lugs, Dugs Godis. Lerds Dugs Godis, which means Saturday candy. <laughs> <laughs> so like, once a week, yeah, they basically they're encu they're encouraged to stuff their gorgeous, flawlessly skin faces with chocolates. And How do they still have the gorgeous, uh, fl flawless skin have with all of this stuffing of the candy? Because they only do it once a week. Okay, fair it's enough. Like can purge. Swedish yeah, so it's, it's brown bread Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah, Friday, fish, and Sunday, yeah, and yeah, pickled fish, yeah. and then you have the candy. Yeah, and really heavy, salty licorice, which I've heard described as eating uh, sump oil. I'm a huge fan of salty licorice. Anyway. Uh, licorice isn't for me. Anyway, so the idea behind Lerd Dags Gordis is is the moderation thing. So if you just do it once a week, you go nuts. Every corner store apparently has pick-a-mix bins where you can go crazy. They sell it by the pound. <laughs> cool. So this is the thing. But few of the Swedes standing in line to load up on the sugary goodness on the Saturday morning realise their weekly indulgence in this thing was inspired by research on patients at a mental institution in the 1940s. What? This uh, definitive, it ended up definitively proving that sugar, particularly between meals, causes tooth decay. <laughs> this is a new theme song, just for fun. That's an old one. Welcome to the Wholesome Show. The smorgasbord oh. to follow a Swedish theme of science. Yes. For people who set up the back of the classroom. In which we ask all the dumb questions, all the interesting ones, and make the stupid statements. Which you, dear leader, I mean, dear listener. Oh. I know, right? Um, therefore, you don't have to. That's what yeah. we do. That's us. That's us. Yeah. I'm Will Grant. I'm uh, Dr. Roderick Griffin Lamberts. And my new title... Uh, Lolly in Chief. Better. Adapted from, of course, Kim Jong-il, because he's got a list. And I think oh, this this week I'm going to become the best ideal leader with versatile talents. <laughs> versatile. <laughs> this is literally on his list of things he's bestowed upon himself. Best ideal leader with versatile talents. So you got a like, Swiss army of talents? Swiss yeah. army knife of yeah. talents? Yeah, everything. And ideal. The Wholesome Show is brought to you not by dear leaders no. or by candy, but no. by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. And this week, they probably won't mind that. Okay. Oh, This week. I, I'm going to be happy. This episode, it's science-ish. Well. And none of it's to do with, you know, body product. Oh, no, not really. <laughs> All right, make me feel happy then. I'm going to make you feel happy, Will. So, look, let's just start. Before we dig straight into Swedish stuff... So the study of dental caries, or caries, which is also um, uh, cavities and other such things. Why, hang on. Technically, it's called caries. Like they just forgot the cavity. Bit. Yeah, I like know. I know. I don't get it either. Cavity. And the study's called Cariology, which could be easily confused with one of my favorite websites, Cariology, 
Yeah. Which is bag bags. porn. I get it. I know I that. I fucking love bag porn. But, but carries, not cavities. No. This sounds like a typo, like in 1920, oh, no. and then someone just went, oh, well, you've got it now. So it's, it's been repeated carries. for infinity. Yeah. And, and so they call it your cariology, and cavities are part of cariology. What else is in cariology? Gross shit. <laughs> <laughs> or, or gross <laughs> tooth gross. It's just like the teeth that grow in your brain or your eyeball or something like no, that. No, well, that was, that was a great episode, though. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Listen, hunt listen, hunt yeah. back through the list, listener, if yeah. you want to find teeth growing in weird places i do <laughs> i might listen to that again just, just because so tooth decay it's caused by infection when bacteria which ferments food debris produces acid which in turn causes demineralization destruction of the hard tissues of the teeth the enamel the dentine and the i like this cementum yeah that's the bit that cementum your teeth together I know, cementum. I need to cementum my teeth, yeah. And it's one, so caries, particularly cavities, I'm, I'm going to forget to say caries. So cavity is one of the most common diseases throughout the world ever, always. Tooth cavities and the things that relate to it. Holes in your teeth. Yeah, or rotting, gungy, bleh. And um, humans and our precursors have had cavities in our teeth for like four bajillion years. Like Forever. Been just going on since teeth existed. Since we were bacteria. Since, right. yes, when we were toothy little bacteria with fangs <laughs> swimming around, Gouging on each other. With holes in our toothy little... Yeah. Bacteria. Or things slowly eating at our teeth. It's yeah, okay. fucking gross. And it's, it's funny, I, I just came from the dentist this morning having had a filling, which is fun, because one of my... Half of my... One of my lips is still numb, so if you sound like I've had a stroke, it's because, you know, one of my you, lips you is numb. Injected with stroke. I was injected with stroke juice. Um, so, Australopithecus suffered from cavities, apparently. There are skulls dating from Paleolithic and Mesolithic... Mesolithic... Mesolithic. Wow. Why is that word so hard? Mesolithic ages show Sto- signs Stone of age. Just go stone age. Stone age dudes have like signs of teeth holes and shit. Um, and the earliest increases in caries, cavities, etc., is attributable to dietary changes, particularly when people started eating things like rice because there's a lot more sugary, carbohydrate oh, stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah. So even so, though we had yeah. them back then, yeah. but, but they became more common when we eaten eaten rice and then yeah. the Swedish candy. Oh, yeah, it took it out. I mean, it's okay. crazy. But we're going to get to that. So there are records from Sumeria, like 5,000 BC, blaming toothworms for cavities. Oh, I like that. Yeah, toothworm. Imagine. I mean, I don't like that. I don't want, I don't want a worm in my teeth at all. Oh, but gross. There's a little worm <laughs> What you got the... there? You got a worm in your tooth. Oh. I don't know what a Sumerian accent is, but... Let me go. I need to cook. And you just go... I got a what? Can I drink boiling water? I don't care. There's a quack dentist that gets the worms out of your teeth. Oh fuck! With, oh, ah. like I was, I was getting my teeth cleaned at a dentist actually the other day. Wasn't it today? No, that was when I got the filling that they found when they cleaned. Oh, okay, my teeth. so you had to come back. Okay, fair. And enough. I said to her, Jesus Christ, you know, as a dental hygienist, and, and in my head, I think I'm so glad you exist. But who in the shit would sign up to be one? And she said, No, teeth aren't gross. You know what's gross? Feet. Did you, did you say this to her? I didn't say who in the shit would do it. I just said, good, God, Good, Because you don't say you. that to people, my God, your job is gross. Yeah, yeah, everything like, you do disgusts me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a conversation starter. Definitely a stopper. No, I just said, God, you know, I don't know how you do it. And she said, no, 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 feet. She says, literally, feet are gross. And she just goes, ugh. <laughs> She's been thinking that long time. She's waiting for people to ask her, what is the grossest thing? Because teeth are gross. And she'll, no, no, feet. Oh, yeah. just, then you go to a podiatrist yeah. and I'm sure that they... Uh, teeth can, I mean, feet can be gross. It's true. Sure. Like, I mean, freaking sure. hideous. Uh, I think many parts of the human body and many parts of the world can be gross. And to be we, fair, thank, though, we thank all, all of the people yes. that, that deal with these gross things for us. Thank you. Now, I'm being nice. I'm being noble. Because, you know, to be honest, I, I want someone to... I'm it. glad they do it. Yeah. I'm glad they do it. And also, you know, some feet... Pretty, and someone has hot, to, really. someone has to be an anus doctor. Do, is it me? Do I have to? I don't be? know. Someone's got to do it. Like I, I assume there's. I've always wondered about that. You know, you're at medical school. And they say, "Do you want to specialize?" You go, "Yep, dates." <laughs> I just want to look up butts. <laughs> well, look, the world needs it. I'm not saying we don't need it. I'm but there, saying, but, but there who was wants a, it? There was a first person. There was someone who said, "Look, okay, I'm. It's going to be me." <laughs> what I need is a specialty. Uh, yeah. Anyone doing <laughs> dates? No. All righty. So anyway, there's evidence of um, people treating uh, cavities with uh, drilling from way back. Like there are teeth found, uh, they reckon, between 5,000 and 7,000 BC in Pakistan that have almost perfect holes. Jesus. How do they make holes back then? Little drills. Yeah, I, I, I thought the drill was invented in like 1910 in, in DeWalt or That's the Bosch. electric drill. Yeah. I don't think it was their electric. <laughs> These might have been goat powered or oh, something. All right. <laughs> Can you imagine how hideous the pain would have been? Okay, just hold him down. We're going to drill a hole in his teeth. I'm sure they used some sort of 
hammer in the head, uh, hit me yeah. between the eyes. A lot of whiskey or something like that or whatever was Even there. that. No, think about that. Think about that, right? You, you, you go to the dentist and they say, look, we're out of anaesthetic. We're just going to get you hammered. We're going to drink this, I don't know, 500 mils of straight whiskey. And so you're fucking chundrously drunk. The room's spinning. You're talking about how you love everyone And then in the throw room. a whole bunch of pain yeah, in yeah, your yeah, teeth yeah. on top a of that. Mouth okay. pain. Yeah, all right, all right. I don't, I don't want that. No. But uh, maybe you're easier to hold down. I, I doubt it. <laughs> Depends how drunk. Passed out drunk, then you might throw up. On you. So in the Egyptian text from about 1500 BC called the Ebers Papyrus, they mentioned tooth diseases. Um, there's an area I don't know. Assyria, I've heard of Assyria. So there's the Sargonid dynasty and there's a king's physician from about 668 ish BC, writing about how spreading inflammation in teeth was stopped by extracting the tooth. Of course, there you go. And Solved again, it. great idea, but whoa, we're going to pull your tooth out. Ah, it'd be horrible. Ah, oh, God, the horror. Um, ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, Egyptians, etc., had treatment for tooth pain. Um, and it's funny, people in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age apparently had fairly low cavity and caries, but then sugar cane appeared in the, yes. around the 11th century and off they went. Ah. Oh. The demon, the demon sugar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should have just kept eating meat and what beetroot. Isn't what? that what all paleo people say? Just, just meat and beetroot. Chase your beetroot around the field and then uh, yeah, eat that. Kill it with a with an ox. Um, they, and the way they treat tooth pain was herbal remedies, charms, bloodletting, you know, all the good stuff. Then, of course, later on, uh, barbers did the tooth thing. As yes, indeed, the barber but, surgeons. Oh, far out again. Ugh. I mean, tooth pain, there's a reason why they use it as a torture in classic movies yeah. or, in fact, reality, because mouth being stabbed. Ah. Um, You're grossing yourself out here. You chose this topic. Oh, it's just horrifying. That's why I like it, because it's so meaty. Oh, we haven't even gone to the good stuff. Um, so the there's a – where were we? Oh, I've lost my spot. There we go. Barbers did that terrible thing. And so the, the upside of that is, of course, they probably prevented a lot of disease spreading, taking out infected shitty teeth. Well, they – Probably. Just getting to that point would have been displeasant. Uh, dentistry has a patron, a patron saint, Apollonia. Saint oh, okay. Apollonia. Um, so her prayers to her are supposed to heal pain caused from tooth infection. Mm-hmm. Um, North American Indians. So they suffered an increase in, in cavities after they came into contact with Europeans because they switched from their normal diets, particularly to maize-based diets, yeah. corn, and, you know, what do you call it? Uh, corn and you get the syrup. corn stuck in your seat, teeth. Yep. And sure. then the worms come out of the corn and they eat the teeth. So, you know, the, the that's been a problem. Uh, getting into the age of enlightenment in Europe, uh, people started to stop believing in the tooth worm and started thinking, oh, maybe it's sugar or something. Oh, well, that's maybe. Um, there's a guy called Pierre Fauchard. He was apparently known as the father of modern dentistry and he was one of the first people to say, eh, I think it might be sugar and shit, fellas. Yeah, okay. Um, he just proclaimed that he didn't have no evidence, evidence here. He just saw a lot of kids eating the candy and, and no it's teeth like, in yeah, that kid. Yeah, like there's something going on. A um, uh, person called Miller in the 1890s found that acid-producing bacteria inhabit the mouth and that they dissolved tooth structures. So there's a connection being made to the yep. bacteria. Okay. We're getting somewhere, you know. He and another fellow called Black and Williams, two different people, researched plaque. And they started to think, oh, we're starting to find out what's going on here. Um, then there was some other folks, a fellow called Fernando E. Rodriguez Vargas, found strains of lactobacilli in the early 1920s. And so they're starting to make these connections. But there were no experiments really demonstrating the connections. Experiments? Yeah, until about 40 years later. Experiments? Yeah, so with that we returned to Sweden. <laughs> experiments? Yeah, okay. experiments. <laughs> Are you sitting comfortable? Oh, I kind of am, but I don't, I don't like the idea of what we're going to experiment here. No, nah, it's going to be fine. It's not that bad. Oh, okay. It's just, just a little bit of science. I just like the idea. Maybe they're going to give one kid just an all-candy diet. Uh, <laughs> you, you, can you see through these pages? <laughs> so in the early 20th century, uh, dentists were still arguing over what caused decay. Was it an underlying disease? Was it diet? Was it due to candies and sugars? Blah, 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 blah. Um, often the clues were pointing to candy. So, And the way they found that out was things like, uh, children, orphans in children's homes that were too poor to provide candy. They had, had less no cavities. candy. Yeah, but they had less. But cavities. they also had less love. Yes, um, in so the that's orphanage. the trade-off. So, well, I'm just, I'm mm. just saying there could be another theory here that love, love might have been love deprivation equals tooth caries. No, no, as in as in lack of love. That's what I'm saying. Love deprivation M- means no cavities. Because yeah. they're the orphans. Oh, you're right. It means none. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so if you don't love them, if you love your kids, then they get cavities. You fuck that, them up. If you beat them and treat them savagely or at least coldly, I teeth, don't think that teeth was good. <laughs> See, obvious conclusion. <laughs> Recommendations or, or something else going on in or orphanages. Other, yeah, I don't know what else happens more. in orphanages. Oh, just 
just they look after you well, <coughs> especially in the early 20th century. So yeah, they were showing there were, there were, there were clear differences between these children and uh, those in the general population. Um, and they noticed also during World War One that the people who were conscripted into war had less tooth decay because there was sugar rationing. What? What? So what? because there was sugar rationing, the ones conscripted as opposed to the ones conscripts, that volunteered. Yeah, but, yeah, but apparently, in yeah, I know it's. I don't know why they say conscript. Basically, sugar rationing around people who were affected by it tended to show less decay. Oh, okay, so that sounds so like people a good, are going hmm. good association. I can hmm. work with that. In Sweden in the 30s, studies found that three-year-old children had cavities in 83% of their teeth. Three-year-olds? Yep, even as young wow. as three. 83% of their teeth. Wow. They hadn't heard a toothbrush or anything back then, I, had I, they? I don't know what they were doing. Uh, but not the right thing. No, oh. no. Um, and they said, look, this, this kind of decay wasn't unusual. Dental care in many countries was pretty shit. I love just a little aside from the US. Um, toothlessness was so prevalent in the US... That when the military was trying to get toothlessness, toothlessness, no teeth, no yeah, teeth, or, okay, or so low, low, low tooth, or you've 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 put uh, pulled the last ones out and put in a yeah. false teeth, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they when they were recruiting people for both World War One and World War Two, the men men had to have at least six intact opposing teeth, <laughs> Jesus, six, not on one side. They had to be opposing, <gasps> so you could do something with that. Yeah, you got to be able to like chomp. It. Yeah, ish. So so ish. three top, two, three bottom. Oh my God! Wow, messed up. So treat, treatments were shit. Other, basically, rotting teeth were pulled out. How did they not notice this was a huge problem? I mean, if everyone's doing it, I get, you know. I it's think like, they did. They noticed it was a problem, but they were like, what, what do we do? We yank them out. It's impossible to do anything about that. Th this is kind of, this is what it smelled like. Like So they're like, we, oh, we know that they turn crappy. Te teeth only last for 10 minutes or so. They're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. a quick thing. The body makes them for when you're a baby. You get another set and that's it. Yeah, you know? like you're three. You've had teeth for a couple of years. You don't need any more gums. Yeah, do Just want? gum your yeah. food. Can't you use a blender? Jesus. You're old enough to use tools. Um, so in Sweden, uh, laws during the 30s, early 40s, mandated municipalities provide dental care to citizens. Okay. Because of 83%, et cetera. But there weren't enough dentists. So they're like, what the fuck do we do? So they got this national epidemic of, and tooth repair is too expensive. So they said, the government went, let's focus on prevention. So far, very reasonable mm -hmm. in principle. The problem was they didn't know how to prevent decay and they weren't sure exactly what they uh, should okay. be preventing yep. Yep. in order to prevent decay. Just, and just a law against it won't be enough. Yeah, we, we mandate now that you'll do better with your teeth. No, no. Sweet. As in, Yes. Um, so they decided uh, we should probably, this is the government commission, a study on the role of diet, candy in particular, and okay. tooth decay. Yep. All very reasonable. The National Board of Sweden decided to undertake a long-term nutritional study to determine the root cause of dental cavities once and for all. And of course, the most desirable and accurate study, they realised, would need to be done on humans. Yes. Duh. And ideally, you'd have human subjects whose vital signs, or, you know, Details could be measured daily, who would follow a drug or dietary regime without fail, and whose environment could be totally controlled by researchers. Oh, okay. Perfect. And they're right. That's how you can be really clear. Uh, okay. So they said to themselves, they stroked their Swedish beards and said, where will we find such people? So the medical board went, well, duh, we have jurisdiction over the state's mental institutions. Oh, great. Oh, Okay, okay, cool. See, this, this is innovative thinking. Yes. This yes. is where we find the perfect conditions. So there were four state mental institutions and the biggest one and the bleakest one was called... <laughs> the bleakest. Bleakest, described <laughs> as perhaps the bleakest, Viperholm. 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 For vipers? Yes. Actually, it was the how, the country's largest facility for, quote, uneducable retards. Oh, no, no. Yeah, that's no. a point. Yeah, uneducable retards. Oh. Yeah. Maybe they pronounce it. Their names the back then were really terrible. Oh, I'll like, give you a few uh, more in a moment. <laughs> that's really wrong. Well, they weren't then. We just made them terrible. I know we have we have um, since become aware of certain things, but geez, they went all the way down. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, and it keeps so going. So un uneducable, uneducable retards. retards. That's it was the largest facility for them. So there wasn't only one facility for uneducable retards, but it was also like the perfect facility for doing the study. It was just outside of Lund, the main sort of town or a main town, and it had been turned into a home for people with severe intellectual and developmental disabilities in 1935. So you had. All kinds of folk. It wasn't just children. Yeah, okay. And they weren't necessarily um, mentally ill. They were impaired. They had a, a variety ways. of different issues that now yes. we might deal with in a different Fancy sort of way. Fancy conditions. So that was going on. And uh, they, they basically, the conditions were kind of like this. The doors of the hospital were always locked. 
only private bedrooms were isolation chambers that didn't have furniture when they had a bedroom. Okay, so that's, that's the only time you get private. In, yeah, is, the, so is, basically patients were in solitary. Where, where they where they were in this condition, they only got privacy if they were in solitary. They'd sleep on a bed bolted to the middle of the floor. Um, many of the patients were in, in such a state they weren't able to dress themselves. Many were tied okay. to their beds. Oh. Um, at meal times, uh, there were never knives or forks. At best, there were spoons only. Oh, okay. Um, and I found a, a lot of this stuff is now based on a, a – there was a Swedish journalist called Thomas Kanger who wrote a whole bunch about this particular study in this institution. And so he was saying there were big halls where they actually just had people running around with nothing to do mm-hmm. to begin with. Um, if they misbehaved, they were bathed in cold water. I love bathed. I think they mean dunked. Yeah. Some of them were just lying on beds all the time. Jesus, and give them something to do. Give them a puzzle. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, you know, they can participate in some research. Or, yes. See? See? Problem solved. All right, yeah. Don't worry about it. So anyway, the researchers would collect they, – they ended up collecting idiots, a medical classification, okay, uh, from all over the country, smaller wards and places, and bring them to Vaporholm. And in medical terms, an idiot was a person with an IQ below 25. Okay. Who functioned at a level of roughly-ish a normal toddler. Below okay. 25 is – it's, it's a long way Very down. Very not a long well. Way down. An imbecile, <clears throat> much better than an idiot, IQ between 26 and 50. Okay. Described as intelligence of a child of about seven. Morons functioned at the intellectual level of a child of about 12. Seriously, when they made up these labels, okay, we were what a variety of labels that are really rude. And well, they I don't think they were. They're only, they're only rude now. Like Idiot, wh- idiot imbecile, and, and moron. moron. Wait, it's a staggered classification scheme. How's that for the question? Which would you rather be? I, I don't want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> which one is worse? <laughs> I I, but it's not immediately obvious which one is less intelligent, an idiot, an imbecile, no. or a moron. I'd feel like today if you called an idiot, that's not so bad. But if you called an imbecile, or a moron, it's worse. Yeah, probably. So it's flipped around a bit. Um, there's Obviously, a physician- of course, um, uneducable retard was all of them. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you got you like, you got to give them something that can relate to. It does feel like what, they, they could have classified more here and they could have got dumbass in there. Uh, shit for brains. Shit for brains. <laughs> shit for brains is between 49 and 52. Yeah. Uh, it's very exclusive. What are you, uh, I'm, a, I'm a shit for brains. <laughs> My dad tells me I'm a shit Plon- for brains. Plonker? What else is that? Plonker. It, it, some some would just be like, oh, not right. quite. You're not quite, are you? Um, there was a there was a, the only physician at the hospital until 1942, a guy called Hugo Frödeberg. He apparently kept copious notes on the patients, and he had his own rankings from zero to six for their mental capacities. Okay, zero group was uh, quote biologically lower standing than most animal species, basically vegetables. Uh, okay, fuck. Um, groups one to three uh, may have a certain spiritual life, but were otherwise unimaginable. Uh, they couldn't imagine things. Yeah, or, or you can't imagine. Or you can't imagine like being what, them. Yeah, like what, who knows what's going on in their pointy little lives. Yeah. And uh, two thirds of the patients during World War II were from the lowest four groups. Two, okay. Two thirds. Um, the journalist again said, uh, basically, the lower functioning groups could just swallow their food. They didn't chew. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said he could see in the journals they were not subject to cavity tests and things because part of the experiment I'm about to describe required chewing. Um, num, num, num. I, I can know. guess where this is going. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so um, they basically, there were people higher levels who were mental equivalents of maybe elementary school preteen okay. children who were allowed to work at jobs that, quote, no other people would like to undertake. Oh, thank you. Do you want to know what they were? Uh, they weren't good jobs, were they? Nowhere near they, as bad as you think. They, they weren't uh, frisbee testing. Is frisbee it frisbee test. testing? <laughs> yeah, you just chew on it. No, I try mean, and swallow you know, it, stick it in. how far you butt. can throw it. No, but it's, it wasn't as bad. Like, I read that and went, oh, God, this list is going to be awesome. It's like laundry, cleaning, growing a garden. Like, what the fuck's oh, wrong with that? That's, they're not bad. No. Not bad at all. But most importantly, these were the patients who could chew and feed themselves. Okay. I love what are your criteria? I'm imagining putting an ethics application now. Uh, how are you recruiting? We want people who can uh, chew and feed themselves. <laughs> like tick. Um, so those are the people who are typically recruited for the study. And the corporate underwriters for this study were sugar, chocolate, and candy companies. Really? This was sponsored by them? Were they yeah. trying to demonstrate here that it wasn't their fault? It was uh, digging around. I couldn't find a lot, but there were certainly implications. I, I get the impression, actually, and this is only impression, that wow. they, they were – Maybe they didn't think it would we, find what it found. We generally want to know. Yeah, it, it could have been. It's like, no, you know, maybe we're not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> have a little look for us if you'd be so kind. Could Please you do it on educable recards? <laughs> 
But um, or yeah. unless the um the Viper Home was already sponsored by uh <laughs> by <laughs> Big Candy. <laughs> Here we go. This is our corporate responsibility. Electrical retard brought to you by Hershey's. <laughs> I don't know what the big chocolate bars of Sweden Imagine at the time the were. Signs on the, the on, on the institutions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Master Foods presents <laughs> people from category zero to three, morons and imbeciles only. Um, so apparently, yeah, they underwrote these experiments, and it wasn't clear to me, at least to begin with. Um, later on, there, of course, and I'll, I'll mention it, but I can say it, a suspicion that perhaps they were not keen on results and maybe okay. put pressure on them, people who did the research, not to release it in too much of a hurry. Um, research. Yeah. Anyway, so in the beginning there was about 650 people involved and apparently grew to over 1,000 people involved. We'll call them, just for fun, participants. Yeah, but you're going to critique the word participant there because they haven't really given consent? Look, consent's a thing that that, that oh. wasn't a thing. <laughs> well, they weren't called participants back then. They no, were subjects. 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 Subjects meaning you are subject to an experimental regime. Yeah. You don't have a choice necessarily. Although, to be fair, when I started studying psych in the 80s, we still were – it was – yeah. Stand call them subjects, but the point—the point of shifting to participant is to say that there is you are Active treating them involvement, yeah, informed consent, yeah, exactly like these guys didn't and couldn't give, yeah. They range from fifteen to seventy years old, so long. Okay, their average life expectancy in this place was not huge anyway. Anyway, so that's the kind of people we're dealing with. At the beginning of the study, the the teeth were closely examined, and on the whole, particularly the children, their teeth were in much better shape than the Swedish population as a whole. Really. Again, probably because they weren't getting a lot they were of poor delicious and so treats they weren't, and stuff. They weren't yeah. getting the candy. They, yeah, they were living yeah. on gruel. Yeah, pretty much. Non-sugared yeah. gruel. Please, sir, may I have another? No one said that. Um, so the first two years of the experiment was apparently called, I love this, the vitamin study. And it kind of was, first two years. Uh, children, in particular, uh, were given uh, a little starch, half the average consumption of sugar in a typical Swedish diet. How the fuck they knew that, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Vitamins A, C, and D were added as, lo- as well as fluoride tablets. So they're getting to eat normally as well. As well. This is to begin with. This yeah. is the study, yeah. And, and they also get yeah, fluoride and they weren't allowed to eat between meals. Okay. No so this is actually like, cool. Yeah, okay. So fed them well. Um, I've seen it claimed that uh, there are some sources a little tricky to verify that what began in 1945 as government-sanctioned trials for vitamins were converted in 1947, two years later, without the knowledge of the government or the medical board, and they suddenly decided to sw- switch to sugar and encourage tooth decay. Um, uh-huh. and, we'll, and we'll get into that. Uh-huh. Um, also, apparently, up until uh, late in the study, some of the employees were part of the experiment, but they became they got removed because you couldn't control their intake of candy. You didn't know. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Oh, that's the reason. You need candy at home. Yeah. Uh, so I had a few uh, snackies, a few yes. sugar snacks. They were delicious. <laughs> I just like the the idea of the employees that are that are raiding the the bag of vitamins or the bag of candy to, you know, take some mm. home. You imagine that? Did you cheat? It's experimental. Yes. I, I cheated. I had extra vitamins and <laughs> and three fluoride tablets. That's why my skin has gone yellow. Fluoridosis is a thing, but we don't get it. So uh, over the two year period, seventy eight percent of the children at least had no new cavities. So it was going fine. Over the next two years, okay. Let's get into part we two. Change the experiment here, as you do, because it's science. Yeah, and you know we're looking for outcomes. Not getting enough cavities here, so we need to change things. Well, I mean, you're being so harsh. They're just they're just scientists. Mm-hmm. They're just people who want to find shit out for the good of humanity. So uh, over the next two years, children were given twice the amount of sugar typically consumed in Sweden. Oh, okay. And this was administered in particular ways. Rectal? No. No. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Your face was worth it. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Are you ready? No. Uh, this isn't fun. Take your sugar suppository. <laughs> I don't think it'd do much to your teeth. So one group ate a sweet, sticky bread made with extra sugar with all their meals. Another group drank beverages with one and a half cups of added sugar. Wow. How do you get a, a cup and a half, Is uh, I assume, Far, per day? Uh, no, meal. Per, per me- meal. How do you get that much sugar in? And how, hang on, how One is that, how is that only double the average? Are they, it's like the average Sweden eat, Swede eating three quarters of a cup of sugar in their drink? Well, I mean, when you, you hear the numbers on um, uh, soft drinks, pop, whatever you want to call it, here at the moment, mm. yeah, maybe there's a shitload wow, of sugar in a glass of Coke, like a shitload. Yeah. 
in the order of many tablespoons. Oh, I thought it was many, many teaspoons. teaspoons. So it was like seven or eight teaspoons. Or Still, imagine like that. that. Yeah. Imagine taking a drink and deliberately adding seven or eight teaspoons. No, no, no. Jeez, one but, and a half cups. But one and a half cups is, yep. a, is an intensely sickly sweet drink. Gross as hell. Even as a kid, I think I would have struggled in a high <laughs> sugar. <laughs> Did you though? Yeah, I'm not against it now either, but not like that. Um, the third group of these three ate chocolates, caramels, or sticky toffees between meals. The sticky candy group, sticky toffee mob, were further divided into children who ate eight or 24 pieces between meals. Wow. And this stuff was specifically uh, developed to stick more to teeth. <laughs> we want to make it worse for you. That shit's frustrating wow. too. You know, you know uh, fantails? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I always think I like them, but then I get to the middle tree bit and it's like, why don't you go away now? now <laughs> my biggest regret is any time, I haven't done this in years because I, I know this now, mm. minties. You put them in your mouth and you go, I regret it instantly. Yeah, it's going to pull mm, all mm. my teeth out. Why won't you go away? Dissolve faster. Yeah, I agree. Like It seems great. And you get that initial minty deliciousness and then eh. So they designed these things to more be super with, sticky. with their theory being that if it's sticky, it's going to be worse for your teeth. Yeah. Great. Thanks Thanks for no, designing. No, no, they don't know that yet. It's no, an experiment. We're just testing here. You're prejudging. Okay. You're not being very science. Were they correct though? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I ruin it? <laughs> So the results of the tooth decay was high in groups which received the sticky sugar between meals. The control group and the sucrose and bread groups were still low. They were still down in the, the level of the vitamin study, essentially, so it okay. wasn't too bad. Um, in both toffee and caramel groups, etc., the increase in cavities occurred immediately after they began eating them, so very soon. Immediately is a bit of a it's not. Word. It's not straight away. Yeah. I had a candy and one of my teeth fell Pop. out. Pop. Yeah. So as the journo Kanga says, they were given toffees or caramels that stuck in their teeth. The teeth were destroyed. And after they were ruined, these people were in terrible pain. It was actually Oh, God. Horrible. Oh, the teeth were destroyed. Oh. So on that, records show, records from the study, that the researchers decided not to fix the teeth for, quote, those who could not cooperate with the fixing procedures. So, like, they were too scared of the drill. Or whatever. Oh, well, they were low on the IQ here. Yes. So. Yeah, they were in the, what do we say, dunderhead or lower uh, category. Yeah. Um, so the people in the lower categories, they just chose not to fix the teeth. But they would probably pull them if they could. Mm. If they could. Mm. Um, they did fix the teeth in the higher order intellect categories, those you know who could actually chew. And By fix, we just mean pull out? Um, or are they, they fill Usually in pulled yeah, out. Okay. Yeah, usually pulled out. So some of them, so I got that wrong. In the lower categories, they basically may have just left them in their heads because it was – too hard. Mm, okay. Um, you know, when you explain to someone with an IQ of 25 to lie still, it's going to hurt for a moment, but it'll be better for it's you. It's not going to work very yeah, well. They okay. don't reply, I see what you're saying, I'll do my best. That is not a typical response. So um, the journo, again, Kanga said, he, he looked at the dental records from the study and he said basically every tooth was black. I'm talking every tooth damaged and Jesus. it went on for years. Oh, aren't you real? Haven't you worked out enough by now? Yeah, I think you got your, you got your data. Oh, my God. At the end of the study, 50 of the research subjects basically had no teeth, totally ruined. It's only out of a, uh, up to 1,000, so it's not even it's not even 10%. Fine. That would 5%. Happen. It would have happened anyway. It would. In, in fact, what we're going to think about is the people they saved who weren't in oh the experimental God. groups. Of course, uh, today you just couldn't do this. No, you couldn't. But it was also, you would add to it, you couldn't do this at all. But back then, of course, also people with disabilities were basically considered subhuman. <sighs> So it was, it was, you know, these are different times. Yeah, you can I do, want to say do innocent, what you like to them. I Thanks, want to say innocent times. Thanks, science of the time. Yeah, not really innocent, though, is it? Um, so it was added. So the, the, the another part of this, according to the journal, was um, these people are also, in a sense, seen as owing the state for their care. Yes, so what so you should do is give us your teeth. Yeah, yeah, it's like a, it's an obligation to I the want community. your teeth to rot in your face. Yeah, as a service to the community who's supporting you. Thank you. Yeah. So, see, it was, it was quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. I always find that hard to say. Just like you in tuberculosis. You probably shouldn't say it very much then. I probably don't. Well, at the moment, it's hard the, not the, to. The people that say it are not good. Not at the moment, are they? So, in a paper written 50 years after the study, one of the original authors defended the work. Uh, a retired professor of cariology, Bo Krasse. And he said, look, it was at a time when information in society was far more limited than it is today. True. He said, look, it was, it was done before things like the Declaration of Helsinki, which was yes. a document, you know, of medical ethics. Before we invented ethics. Yes. So First can, written in 1964. So it was before that. How can we possibly be ethical? We don't know what suffering was. It hadn't been defined yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> until, until an international committee had agreed on suffering. Yeah. And it he, took the Germans to help us there. You can't see it. 
the Germans were the inspiration. Nuremberg first. Um, so then he goes on to say, uh, we dentists did not see any ethical problems with the study itself. Um, and he disagreed with the journalist saying... How can you not see ethical... Pro- I, I, I don't get, know. I, I get the... N- treating people of an intellectual impairment as different. Yes. But how can you not see any ethical problems when you're deliberately ruining people's teeth? Yeah, you're fucking people yeah, up. Like, you, 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 you deli- and, and everyone needs to eat, regardless of your intellectual impairment. Yep, or your ability to chew for that matter, uh, I Indeed, indeed. Yeah. You know, I just, I just, how can you not see an ethical challenge there? Yeah, and, and look, you can have an IQ of seven, you can still show suffering, I'm going to bet. I think there are animals that are a long way below that that are <coughs> able to suffer if you are so inclined to make them so. And look, if there's anyone out there listening who's never had a toothache, you're very lucky, but I'm guessing most of you slash us have, and they suck. But can't we, can't we find, like, teeth in dead people and and put them in a sticky toffee or something, trying to replicate the environment a little bit? You, you can do whatever you want in your spare time, man. But we're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about science here. We're talking research. Um, so, yeah, this guy goes on. So he, the Beau Crasset, the one of the original researchers, said he disagreed with Kanga's view that the, the teeth were totally destroy, destroyed. And I love this. No, oh, black is fine. This is bullshit. Yeah, no, oh. you're full of shit. <laughs> and his response, uh, I don't understand this quote, to be honest. Many of the new cavities which developed during the carbohydrate periods were only early enamel lesions, which today are remineralized by topical fluoride applications. Today. Yeah, yeah, so... How's that a defence? Fuck you. Well, no, 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 no. We we know how to make them cured now, so therefore they're fine then. Therefore they weren't totally destroyed. (laughs) So basically shut the fuck up, hysterical journalist. Uh. Just, I don't see how he thinks that's a defence, but apparently he did. So the wash-up of this. um, Before the Vaporholm experiments, the cause of the tooth decay had been highly contested. And there's a book called by uh, Samira Kawash, Candy, a century of panic and pleasure. Oh, cool. She noted, I think she, Samira sounds like a, a, uh, does, a lady yeah. to me. She noted that people blamed their dental woes on everything from wine and hot foods to masturbation and vitamin deficiency. Of course it was masturbation with your hot food, though. And I don't like to how, talk about anything that the, doesn't the, have masturbation the as The problem cause. was that this study wasn't brought to you by hot food and masturbation. <laughs> big, big masturbation. Big wank. I, I do like the idea that that um, that Big Sugar sponsored this study, though. Yeah, I, I, it seems I'm, a little bit dumb of them. It's perplexing. I, I think, mean, if they had said, yeah. "Okay, let's test it with some hot food as well," uh, yeah, yeah, can you yeah. get, get one group and uh, hammers? Hot, hot let's food. see if hammers are worse. For yeah, tea. hammers, they're bad. Gravel. And one group, you're gonna you a lot of masturbation, yep. and another group, and then let's see what happens then. Yeah, how, how are the wankers going? They're still at it. <laughs> have you looked at their teeth? Oh, we haven't had a chance. They're still at it. They've gotten really good. Um, by 1938, leading scientists around the world were pointing to this notion of, of either a lack of vitamins or carbs, sugars, etc. but there was no definitive proof. So in that sense, the study was a success. Oh, it totally is. It I showed get it. a very clear it. link. And, you know, I think, clear. I think we've established that there may well be studies that can show things, even if they're not 100% ethical, but we wouldn't do them anymore. Oh, are there? Uh, Name 11. Um... So, but the scientists also, there are accusations of being bought out by the sugar industry. I'm not entirely sure how that happened. Yeah, bad, bought out badly. Like if mm. I was, if you know, I get that there are people, big tobacco, big coal, big yeah. sugar, yeah. that might want to support research to find their results. Seems yeah. like they did it really incompetently here. Yeah, so let's buy them out. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this didn't we look good. We bought the wrong ones. <laughs> this went all the wrong way. <laughs> we were hoping you say more candy, but instead so you said, don't use candy. when you did the results, why did you not do these ones? It's, um, your Swedish accent's getting a lot better. I'm oh, like, thank you. Thank you. Like, well. You've got you to give me warning to practice these things. No. <laughs> and also what? Yeah, I get so. What? <laughs> Don't worry. There, there's some Russians in Sweden. I think that's fine. It's fair to say. <laughs> My one accent. Yeah. Um, but there, apparently there weren't a lot of public debates about the ethics of the experiment for a while. No surprise there. And there's some suggestion that maybe the, the results were held back for a while until into the 50s. Um, so Krasa, again, the guy who was a participant in defending it, it's obvious that a research ethics committee would not accept a project like this today. Uh, mm-hmm. duh. The need for the study, however, was obvious to us as dentists. So the Swedish parliament and then in the news they started debating the ethics of the study around 1953 or from that point forward. Uh, and, of course, you can't say the Swedes are the only people to be dead shits to their people in the no, name of no, science. No. You know, that many other examples. We don't need to go into them. I think probably nearly every country. Every country that had some sort yeah. of industrial size yeah. science yeah. probably was bad. Yeah, so pretty bad. 
1957, following publication of the study, a coordinated public health campaign kicked into gear. So the radio public service announcements. That is this when we're going to get pro candy on Saturdays? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is how it came. This is how it came out. So, uh, yeah, home-delivered pamphlets, posters in waiting rooms. They encourage young Swedes to brush their teeth and eat less candy. And a new message went around. It was not to prohibit it, but moderate. And the mantra was, translated. In moderation. All the sweets you like, but only once a week. <laughs> That's great. I know. <laughs> So it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So and I, it was, I still don't know good. about the all your sweets you like, but just once a week. I mean, I, I get that is moderation, but hmm. well, this, this is what we do at home. Like my wife and I, Fat Fridays, Friday night. Yeah, have at it. I get it. And, and now, of course, the less you eat, a whole bunch of like you know, you try and eat two liters of ice cream, and you get worse at it. So I bring home this enjoyable <laughs> amount of ice cream. Like, this is gonna be great. You've lost your two liters of ice cream fitness. I know. <laughs> So disappointing. Like, I come home with these mountains of shit and I get through a tenth of it and think, this isn't fair because now I've got to wait another week. No, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the, you know, in mo- the, the once a week in moderation. Yeah. You know, that, you know yeah. when you're allowed to break the rules. Mm. And I do think ultimately it's healthier. Unless you once a week is like, okay, I only do shitloads of heroin once a week or... or yeah, yeah. Or I only drink two... Or hammer your head. Uh, to, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to go out to the garage and start smacking uh-huh. my head for a while. <laughs> So th- this went on, and, and as a result of what was learned from these um, patients, the, again, Krasse, who was defending it, said, look, research began on sugar substitutes and artificial sweeteners. As it was inspired by this, and the study has been used to prevent cavities in many school children and cited numerous times by other reviewers. Well, there's a whole bunch of... So, a whole other story so basically what he's saying there is you uh, these... Uh, intellectually impaired people, or yep. as he said, imbeciles, idiots, and morons, retard, took, a, retards, took a few yeah. cavities for the rest of us. Yes. Yeah. And and look, honestly, okay, take out the fact that they're human beings with actual feelings who can experience suffering. Gee, sure, you yeah, take it out. Just nip that out for a moment. Immense amounts of good followed. Sure. Put, put it back in again. Ah. Sure, sure. So, yeah, it, it was the origin of this, um, this, 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 the Saturday candy, et cetera, et cetera. And, so great. So, and, and I'm going to end with him, his final reflection. Okay. This is, again, direct quote. My reflection now is that the Viperholm study illustrates two well-known sayings. One, the end sometimes justifies the means. Oh, yes. That's a famous mm-hmm. one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And two, it's easy to be wise after the event. <laughs> Look at you fucking say, you're wise after the event. What a dick. Yeah. I mean, I get it at the time. You were held to different standards. So I understand. Then it's easy for us to look back and go, you know, oh, we would never have done such a thing. I can't guarantee we wouldn't. I just don't know for sure. I'm sure we are doing things like that now, but yeah. we, we are working to not do them. I think yeah. in that time, you know, sure, in that time things were different, but there, there isn't a lot of effort to try not to be. Uh, it doesn't sound like it, does it? It's just like, like look, you're subhuman and also the state's looking after you. So here's your opportunity to give back. I just think that there are multiple ways to do a study like that that yep. would tell you some of these things. You know, you've already got yep. the inkling there. People who can't afford candy yep. are less likely cavities, so fair enough. I'm sure you could do some sort of teeth in a jar experiment. Well, you know what else? This this smacks to me, and I don't know about the history of epidemiology. I don't know where as a study it really began, and for those of John you... Snow. Yeah, I suppose so, but I don't know as a practice if it really took off, mm. you know, like the, the methods and so forth. But, you know, the idea that you get enough people in enough places under the same conditions, repeatedly measuring it. Yes, you say it's correlation, but well, in the end, the you get to a point where you go, there is so much correlation here, and we've looked for other causes. That's that's the tricky thing. You know, when yeah. when how much correlation do you need to make a, a policy decision? And but it's accepted in epidemiology now, not then, but yeah. it's accepted that there are certain measures where you go, you know what? We should act on it anyway. We're pretty confident. I think so. We're pretty confident. Look, and there's a whole bunch of things where you don't do the, you know, the the gold standard in medicine, the double bu- double blind peer reviewed control. The double bind. The, the double bind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do I or don't I? You mm. tie up the researcher yep. and you tie up the participant. But you do those. Yep. You do the yep. the gold stat. There's there's places where you can't do that. Like I love yep. I love you know yep. you, you don't do that on parachutes. So there's some studies. <laughs> Some studies we just don't do. Can you imagine? Look, we've got some people who are very low educated. We're going to push them out of planes. Yeah, imbeciles. The ones without parachutes. Imbeciles, no live. parachutes. Idiots get a parachute. And the other guys you get to choose for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, so there, there you go. There you go. And uh, yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we know these things now. Yeah. But the pathway to know them, that's not always good. Well, anyway, yeah, and look, it's not like, it doesn't quite equate from what I read with uh, the you know the horrors of Nazi Germany where they were just doing it for shits and giggles, honestly. 
Yeah, and one of the and, and a study. I'll I'll do it for you one day. And I, it's a, it's always sitting in my to do list. Yeah. You know, it's the hypothermia experiments, which are the classic. Oh fuck yeah, they're it's, hardcore. It's, yeah, it's yeah. the classic one of uh, we learned some things, but was it ethical? But it turns out sometimes they didn't even learn stuff. They yeah, just still made shit up. Yep, yep. This was not that. It seems at least. Yay. The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. Yes. I'm Will Grant. Yes, he is. And that's Rod Lambert. And this theme song is from a long time ago. Nostalgia episode.